Hi, everyone. Another Friday, another very juicy topic today. So <laughs> we're discussing Murray Rothbard and actually, more specifically, his relationship to Ayn Rand and the things he wrote about and he said the things he said about Ayn Rand. So why is this an important issue? Well, Murray Rothbard is one of the leading, most iconic figures of the libertarian movement. Quite often, there's this discussion, well, why don't you consider yourself libertarians? Or wasn't he good in economics? What else do we need? So that's why we will discuss these things. So we'll discuss it as usual every Friday with Jonathan Honig, but also we have a guest today, James Valiant. He's a regular, but he's whenever there's a historic topic that we need clarification, you know, we know who to call, and that's James. So here's some context here. So Rothbard, at a relatively young age, is part of the, maybe not the inner, but part of the circle of Ayn Rand around the late 50s, when Ayn Rand is finishing Atlas Rag, and he's, he's working on his own, uh, he's working towards man, economy, and state. He recognizes Ayn Rand as someone very important and influential. Uh, when Atlas Shrugged is out, he writes or tells something like, you know, you are something like the sun to me, according to George Riesman at least. And then there comes a breakdown in the relationship. So what happens is, again, according to more neutral accounts, is that Rothbard had taken some things from Ayn Rand's thoughts and also from Barbara Brunson's thoughts, and he did not acknowledge it. And as George Riesman has said, to a friendly audience to Rothbard, by the way, you can go to the Mises Institute and listen to Riesman's memories from meeting Rothbard and Rand. So, and because Rothbard did not want to recognize that he owed this intellectual debt to Rand, he let Riesman go. But this was not the main thing. Later, Rothbard wrote an essay called The Sociology of the Ayn Rand Cult. I, I reread it some hours ago. It was super entertaining, maybe not in a good way, but it was fun. We're going to read some funny quotes for that. And also he uh, wrote a play called Mozart is a Red. Mozart was a Red, which mocks Ayn Rand. So the question is, and why is this important? Because as James was telling us before we begin, some of these stereotypes that Rothbard creates in his essay and in the play are part of the arsenal that people use to attack objectives. Say that it's a cult. There's this, uh, there's this uh, religious aura of the leader. And basically, if you disagreed with Ayn Rand, you were shown the door. So we are here to, this, to, to figure out the myth from reality. So James, first comments about Rothbard and about his relationship with Rand. Well, the first thing to notice is that he was powerfully and overwhelmingly influenced by Ayn Rand in his own thinking. Um, he made profound errors along the way, especially after he left Ayn Rand, but he was profoundly influenced by Ayn Rand. When he, in the late 1940s, he was a, a young Misesian. Ludwig von Mises was his mentor and master. So he very much agreed with the Austrian value-free approach, subjectivist approach, uh, utilitarianism approach, he was an opponent of natural rights. He did not appreciate Aristotle. When he read Atlas Shrugged, he wrote Ayn Rand a really glowing uh, letter uh, of appreciation. He even defended Ayn Rand against the attacks of Whitaker Chambers in a letter to the editor in response to Whit Whitaker Chambers' critical review of Atlas Shrugged back in 1957. So back James, when I'll, 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 I'm going to share that letter really quickly. It's been mentioned twice. This is just a little excerpt. Uh, only quoting now, only twice in my life have I felt honored and happy that I was young and alive at the specific date of the publication of a book, first of human action in 1949, and now with Atlas Shrug. That was in 1957, Rothbard to Ayn Rand. And there he's ranking it with the work, with the masterwork of his own mentor, Ludwig von Mises. Um, and further in the uh, letter, he says that it is a no one of the greatest novels ever written, one of the greatest books ever written, filled with all kinds, brimming over with all kinds of ideas, important ideas. And in fact, you can see the ideas in his later work, uh, how different he is, for example, than Mises or any of his uh, prior economics mentors. He was convinced of natural rights by Ayn Rand 
and that is defended in his book, uh, the, the Ethics of Liberty, for example. He was def he became an Aristotelian. He basically uh, tossed out uh, much of the Kantian subjectivism that Austrians had and adopted Aristotelianism. Now, obviously, those are huge, overwhelming influences on his life. Uh, his later work shows him to be, I think, what objectivists would call a rationalist. He was still in favor of a priori deductive approach to uh, solving problems. Uh, so he was what we would call a rationalist and no objectivist in that sense, even methodologically. And of course, he became an anarchist. Now, in the wake of Atlas Shrugged's publication, he did enter the Ayn Rand circle. So, uh, several friends of his, such as George Reisman and Leonard Ligio, those guys, his friends, became uh, part of Ayn Rand's circle, perhaps uh, one of the wider subsets of her circle, not the inner circle, but still started hanging around Ayn Rand to learn from her. And as I say, they obviously did learn quite a bit from her. Now, of course, Murray Rothbard never cites Ayn Rand once in any of his works in which he defends Aristotle or in which he defends natural rights, ideas he, or free will, ideas he clearly got from Ayn Rand without giving her a single citation. <clears throat> there was a moment where he, in a published uh, essay, published in an uh, academic journal, in fact, argued for free will, basically using Ayn Rand's argument for free will. Barbara Brandon, in her own master's degree at NYU, had defended uh, the concept of free will, and uh, objectivists noted the profound overlap between Barbara Brandon's defense of free will and Murray Rothbard's defense of free will. And Murray was, Rothbard, was Rothbard part of the collective? Was he, he on par with Peacock and others? No, no, he wasn't like Brandon or Peacock or Greenspan, who were at the you know really close to Ayn Rand intellectually at that time. Uh, he was part of what I would call the wider circle that was really starting to grow. Uh, in ever increasing uh, numbers, uh, the circles around Ayn Rand grew and grew. And he was one of the first, part of one of those first outer circles, but never really part of a collective. And he was also part of the audience. He and the friends he met, you mentioned also Ralph Rako and people who later became more towards the, the anarcho capitalist side the, and the Mises Institute. But uh, he was also part of the audience of, of the students, so to speak, in the, in the first days of the Nathaniel Brandon Institute again, from what George Riesman says. Right so, right. so during the time, so but why is this important? If I understand well, James, during the time when he writes this controversial piece, controversial whether he's, has, he's taking it from Rand or whether it's his own thoughts, he's part of the, the universe, let's say. Maybe not, not the first orbit, but definitely the one of the second, the third orbit. orbit. Right, <laughs> maybe the next orbit out or two, right, exactly. Uh, you know, there was a whole group of people, writers, economists, phlo young philosophers, you know, uh, the writer Ira Levin, or, you know, uh, the, the circle around Ayn Rand was increasing in the er uh, exponentially in the early 60s. Uh, now, Murray Rothbard, in his attempt to defend himself against the charges of plagiarism, uh, said and consulted apparently uh, others such as Helmut Schuck, the author of Envy, who assured him that these were just part, uh, Ayn Rand's defense of free will was just a cliche, standard defense of free will, part of the Western tradition since uh, time immemorial. Well, I myself did some research on this topic. You know, um, the closest things that come to Ayn Rand's theory of free will, of course, are like John Locke's or William James, but even they don't have Ayn Rand's theory of free will, thinking, the choice to think is the primary act of free will. Since then, I've learned that maybe there was some an ancient uh, student of Aristotle who said something similar, very obscure, extremely obscure. Um, so that defense just completely falls apart. Murray Rothbard was called on the carpet for that plagiarism. He was called on the carpet um, in effect for a, a variety of other issues, but this was the one that focused it. He had already started developing anarchism, which was anathema to Ayn Rand as an idea, but the proximate cause of his the break with, uh, with the Rand Circle was this plagiarism issue. Um, but either one of those issues, in my view, would have been sufficient to uh, boot him from the movement, it seems. So you know, here's... Let me play a bit here, the devil's advocate, so and lead us to the next stage of the discussion. So Rothbardian could say, look, okay, maybe it was plagiarism, but what is important is that after that, Rothbard exposed the unhealthy environment and, uh, around Ayn Rand. Therefore, okay, maybe Rothbard didn't wasn't a great guy, but at least he exposed that the objectivist movement, at least in his early stages, 
uh, did not stand up to the principles, and which is what he claims in the sociology of the Ayn Rand cult uh, uh, article. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, I think there are things to criticize in the early uh, objectivist movement. I don't think they primarily relate to Ayn Rand at all. Uh, I think they relate to Mr. Brandon and uh, the complaints from people who weren't even friendly with Nathaniel Brandon or Murray Rothbard afterwards uh, are sufficient to demonstrate to me that Nathaniel Brandon was acting um, in an abusive way through psychological counseling revealing secrets that he got in psychological counseling, manipulating people in bad ways. And I don't think a lot of that got to Ayn Rand, even that Brandon was doing that until her own break with him in, the 19, in 1968. Uh, on the other hand, what Rothbard is criticizing about the objectivist movement is simply false. What he says is mostly mythology. He wasn't coming to the, he wasn't really zeroing in on Nathaniel Brandon's specific abuses, say as a psychotherapist, he was zeroing in on Ayn Rand, who was really, in my view, innocent uh, of the sort of things uh, that uh, she later got tarred with, you know, a cult and that kind of thing. She, she herself, her behavior and her statements gave no credence in my mind to that kind of a thing. Uh, only Brandon's behavior did. And Murray Rothbard's criticism is really focused on Ayn Rand and his published works, like the sociology of the Ayn Rand cult. He mentions Brandon and so forth. In my own personal- Jonathan, yeah. shall we, well, so, just, that people, uh, uh, yeah, so that people get uh, some context, can we get some, some examples from Jonathan here? Sure, well, I'll, and I, I wanna also mention, uh, James, your knowledge of the Brandons is, is quite extensive. You wrote literally the book on the Brandons that's over your left-hand shoulder there, The Passion of Ayn Rand's Critics, which is, is chock full of real interesting in-depth research and history about the Brandons. Um, but, you know, I, you know, when I read, actually went and read, you know, Rothbard's so-called critique of objectivism, critique of Ayn Rand, it, it is so petty and foolish um, that it almost, it, it, it's, it's almost a joke. Here he's complaining, this is now in 1972, where 15 some years later after he wrote Rand, praising it. So he <laughs> says, you know, basically saying, you know, I, it's almost a, a mistake to read it, but, you know, he says, my own experience, a top Randian once asked me rather sharply, how is it that you don't smoke? When I replied that I'd only, and I discovered early that I was allergic to smoke, the Randian was mollified. Oh, it's okay then. The idea being that if you're a so-called Randian, James, then, you know, you smoke, you dye your hair red, you love skyscrapers. And, you know, maybe in, you know, in my experience with objectivism, going back to the early 2000s, that just never been the case. No. Here, a, here's oh. an example of why this is a lie, first of all. Sorry, James. I'll go. I've heard Peekoff saying in the podcast that he quit smoking way before Rand because he had some uh, issues with the... Uh, because he was he was chain smoking a lot and he was smoking unfiltered cigarettes. So this idea that if you were not smoking, so someone from the inner, inner, inner circle was gave up smoking. So from I mean, it's this oozes that it's BS. It's oozes totally that it's totally sorry? BS. The total BS. There were people around Rand who did not smoke, who had no allergy with it, <laughs> who quit smoking before Rand quit smoking. Rand quit smoking. By the 1970s, the objectivist world had in fact completely said that it come to the point when I started interacting with objectivists, they were already at the point that smoking was actually immoral. For if you were to get hooked on smoking now, that would be an immorality because that's anti-life. So I, I get, I'm a so far from Rothbard's idea that objectivism, when they got the science of it by the early 1970s and when Ayn Rand quit smoking and so forth, they turned on a dime so far from well, it being any kind of moral principle. Uh, now it is the standard objectivist view in my, in my experience that taking up smoking is immoral. Well, here's one too, also from, from Murray Rothbard's screed. Uh, wit and humor, as might be gathered from this incident, were verboten in the Randian movement. The philosophical rationale was that humor demonstrates that one is not serious about one's values. I mean, James, there's so many examples of Rand 
enjoying <laughs> humor, employing humor. Her books are full of humor. And so many objectivists side even her nonfiction newsletter in the magazine filled with humor, all manner of humor. So uh, to Nikos's <laughs> point, it's just complete BS. No, in fact, Ayn Rand in the Romantic Manifesto defends the virtue of humor explicitly. So we have expli repeated, explicitly published works from Ayn Rand where she defends humor. She says it's not an unlimited value, but right there she says it's a value. Uh, it's absurd on the face of it. Uh, Thank you, Dan. Uh, Daniel, by the way, supporting us in the super chat. Thank you so much, Daniel, for always participating in the in the support as well. Thanks, Dan. Here's my two favorite parts. The one is where apparently Rothbard tells someone from the inner circle that he's read Atlas Rugged once, and the person from the inner circle says something like, what, only once? And apparently that person had read it, wait, wait, where is it? Uh, 35 times. So again, the maths don't add up. There's no way during the time that Rothbard was in the circle that someone had read Alas Rag 35 times and told him off for not doing so. BS or the other on one. The face of it. Yes. So, sorry? BS. On BS. The face. And listen to this one. <laughs> Personal enjoyment oh, I have indeed it. was also thrown upon in the movement and denounced as hedonistic, quote, whim worship. Again flatly contradicted by numerous published assertions by both Brandon and Rand. Pleasure is a psychological necessity. How many times does objectivist literature say that? I mean, the whole point of the objectivist uh, aesthetics, theory of aesthetics, is that certain kinds of pleasure that appeal to our metaphysical values are in fact a psychological necessity. This is well, let, me, let me play as Nikos would say, the devil is advocate for a minute here. Uh, you know, is there, is there any value in someone who's interested in free markets, James, in exploring something of, of Rothbard? I mean, I was, when I was just kind of getting interested in, in Rand, Rand was, uh, Rothbard was kind of introduced with Rand. They often seem to go together. Do you think there's any value in exploring anything when it comes to Rothbard or is it someone to be just left on the side of the road? Well, I, when I first got into Ayn Rand in the 1970s, I, wasn't connected to anybody associated with any of these <laughs> movements or branches. And I figured I'd read everything, everything, everything even remotely related. Uh, all those who said they might have been influenced by Ayn Rand or who others told me were influenced by Ayn Rand. So I uh, was like a vacuum cleaner sucking it all up. And there, I will have to say that there are insights that I gleaned from Murray Rothbard, not many, most of what he said is not original to him that's of value. Most of it is rooted in Mises. He wrote a two-volumed commentary on human action that Mises himself said was a definitive commentary on his own work. So man, economy, and state, if you're an economist, uh, study it. There's probably something uh, of value in there that might elaborate on a Misesian idea. Now, particularly, oh, sorry, James, one thing particularly the last part, power and market. So Rothbard was, in a way, my bridge between Marxism and free economics. So I got a lot of value out of this. And Rothbard had an instinct for being a builder movement. Now we can criticize the ways he goes. So for example, in the 60s, we see him with some Maoist because the idea is we, 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 we form alliance against the Vietnam War. Then later in the 90s, we see him with some edgy personalities going towards weird avenues towards the right. So, but he, he- Conservatives, he's gone from in the 1960s praising the Viet Cong communists as heroes to the 1990s where he's associated with Pat Buchanan and the sort of nationalist right-wing movement. Yeah. yeah, but but this, so this, let's say populist element makes him a good communicator. So it leads in bad politics, but some of his examples defending free uh, free economics really stuck with me. So I think there is value to be taken both from money, economy and state and some other of his, also his work on uh, the Great Depression, I found it quite oh. good. So, well, okay. uh, and, we, and we want to thank Shadowblade for your generous contribution. He joined Clubhouse. So you remember after our, after our uh, presentation here, join us on Clubhouse for a, to keep the Q&A going. And Christopher Smith gave us Canadian dollars, which given 
the American dollar these days are <laughs> becoming even more valuable by the, by the minute. So thank you all for your participation, being with us every day and supporting James and, and his work and all of our work as well. So and I, was James, about, I interrupted you, though. You were saying something about, about echo what Nico said. My favorite work, I think, by Murray Rothbard is his work, America's Great Depression. It, it is one of the really good definitive statements. There have been a lot of good statements and analysis of the Great Depression and how it was not a phenomenon of the free market as it was perceived by so many in the 1930s. But uh, Rothbard's treatment of America's Great Depression is one of the clearest and best written treatments, I think, of, of that topic. Uh, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't say don't read him. I sure read him and read everything. And when I got to New York City, uh, you know, I started started in in what uh, the early 1980s. He was active there in New York City, and that's where and when I got to know him. I went out of my way to get to know Murray Rothbard because I had that open a mind about everything I was going to read. Tell us, uh, tell us something about that experience. How was it? He was, you know, I would audit some of it. He taught economics at Brooklyn Polytechnic while I was attending. I started NYU when I was 18 in uh, 1981. And at the time, a friend of mine was actually attending his course officially. And so I would audit the courses by Murray Rothbard. And through that process, I got to know him and got to know him rather well. He invited me to participate in a seminar he was giving on the history of economic thought through the Center for Libertarian Studies. And I participated in that seminar and got to know him kind of well. I had pizza and beer with him on his birthday in 1982. Uh, that's how friendly we got. I started working at a Greenwich Village bookstore laissez-faire books, which was the primary libertarian bookstore at the time, mostly mail order business, but they had a physical brick and mortar shop in Greenwich Village where I worked as the weekend sales clerk. So I got to know a lot of people around the libertarian movement, anarchists, um, students of Murray Rothbard, economists at NYU, who, you know, at NYU, they had a certain cadre of uh, students of Mises there. So <laughs> believe me, I heard all these criticisms of Ayn Rand you know, the urban mythology and Murray Rothbard, in my view, the greatest error he made, uh, even apart from his plagiarism and anarchism. And this may trump them all. He is the source of so much of the urban mythology. We've covered a few issues here. But, you know, there was one issue that really bothered me when I read the sociology of Ayn Rand called. He said people were booted out because they didn't share her taste in music or art. That if you didn't like Rachmaninoff, You were excommunicated, I love that phrase, excommunicated, as if Ayn Rand was running a church and was a pope or something. But you were excommunicated because you didn't share her taste in art. So I followed up with a question. Murray, who, who? Can you name anyone? Do you know anyone? Are there any examples of anyone who Ayn Rand unfriended or became unfriendly with or was morally- This is you actually asking him. I asked him, who was kicked out? Who did Ayn Rand harshly judge for their, more, for their taste in music? Uh, and he said, he did not respond <laughs> with any examples. He said, ah, Jim, it was mostly, excuse my imitation. <laughs> ah, Jim, it was mostly uh, fictionalized. Wow. Oh, well, that's it. I mean, that's largely fictionalized. His exact, I mean, that's, largely that's fictionalized. it. I mean, I, I mean, on that alone, like example. You know, I, I actually didn't know that to be the case. I assumed there was a lot of shit going around, around the Brandon era that was probably pretty unsavory. Because I knew, so if this was fictionalized, then in my mind, Rothbard is basically to be dismissed. And thank you, Emmanuel, for your generous support as well, your dollars, uh, your contribution. Thank you for that. Thank you, Micah, for your contribution as well. But James, this is a real revelation to me that Murray Rothbard himself admitted to you that a lot of this, I don't know, maybe all of it in the, in, uh, the Ayn Rand cult was, was fictionalized. Oh, totally. Here's some other example on music. Leonard Peikoff, all through this period, through the early 1960s, throughout the 60s and 70s, loved jazz, the kind of jazz that Ayn Rand did not like, specifically, right? So right. Uh, one could have, and Marianne Schurz in her, uh, Schurz in her uh, own memoir explains how she presented Ayn Rand with a painting she liked by Cezanne. Ayn Rand didn't act moralistically. She wanted to Is know that the, why That's Mary the facets Rand of Ayn Rand book? Right? Uh, uh, I'm sorry? The Facets of Ayn Rand. Facets of Ayn Rand. Yeah, Marianne Suris and her husband wrote uh, a wonderful memoir in which they yeah. include exa aesthetic examples uh, uh, of disagreement with Ayn Rand, giving a much more realistic uh, presentation. It's a load Fascinated. of bullshit, basically. 
the load of bullshit. Just, that to, just designed about. to denigrate Ayn Rand because he was being called out having plagiarized her. Am I summing right. it up? But yeah. here's a question. Here's a question that goes beyond the fact that he's uh, he's lying on that. The question is, does he really understood objectivism? And here's an example. If you notice, for example, in Mozart was a red, he talks, he makes uh, Jeffrey Tucker, which I think to his uh, credit, I think later uh, regretted participating in this mocking sketch. So he plays, I think, Nathaniel Brandon, and, and, and he talks about rationalism, which in the objectivist lingo, let's say in the objective universe, is a negative term, and he talks about rationalism as something positive. Or in the sociology of the Ayn Rand cult, at some point he says something like, Randians wouldn't talk with libertarians and objectivists. So he makes some terminology issues that either I'm understanding something wrong, or it seems to me that Rothbard had major gaps in his understanding of Rand and objectivism. Is that, is that right, James, or am I getting something wrong? No, you're precisely right. He is a classic example of Ayn, what Ayn Rand would call a rationalist. You can see it in the psychoepistemology of his written works. He even explicitly says so. I'm going to approach this deductively from a series of a priori premises. I mean, methodologically, he is explicitly still a rationalist by his own assertions. And you can see he really never, you know, and as a politically ambitious person, as you pointed out, he was a political organizer very eager to create a, what he called a cadre of activists, intellectual activists who would develop uh, political activism as well. And he saw Ayn Rand's uh, atheism and he saw Ayn Rand's aesthetics as limitations of the audience, right? Ayn Rand prefers romantic music, right? She prefers, say, Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky over Mozart. Well, to even to state a preference like that in his view would be to cut off important audience. What if someone likes Mozart? No, I know dozens of objectivists who love Mozart. <laughs> Whatever Ayn Rand said about it. So no, he didn't grasp her aesthetics, but to him, the idea of having an aesthetics would be a limiting factor on our political ambitions and having as big a, a, a tent, if you will, politically as possible. Atheism, he regarded the same. And, and he so, was an atheist himself, right? Oh, he yes. was an atheist. His wife, Joey, was a Christian, um, and he claims that that created pressure in the objectivist movement. But again, there's numerous examples. Yeah, Ayn Rand was friendly with Christians. Ayn Rand was civil with people like Leonard Reed and all manner of other Christians in the 1940s, 50s, and even 60s without such pressure. So um, again, we uh, uh, nonsense there. But he was himself an atheist, but he did not want atheism associated with his political ideas because he thought it would limit the the popularity the exposure see Ayn Rand was trying to get at something deeper more philosophical the premises that generate a, pol a political viewpoint and Murray Rothbard would have none of that uh to him that's to begin with that's far too systemically uh, almost religious in his in mind even though he's the one constructing sort of a deductive you know, perfect uh, system out of pure deduction from axioms. So his thinking was more religious than Ayn Rand's, in fact. Is it? Well, is it is, sorry, Jonathan, go on. No, I was just going to say, you know, and, and James, since so often capitalism is falsely associated with anarchism, you can say, oh, you know, you're for capitalism. It's just a dog eat dog world where people do whatever they want. And you have to stop and say, you know, no, that's not what capitalism is at all. You know, it's it's why it's I think probably pretty dangerous to even bring up Rand and Rothbard in the same sentence or even associate well, think, them politically or philosophically in any way. Agreed. I think that we have to, you know, two criticisms that Ayn Rand had of the libertarian movement are one, they steal her ideas, but two, they steal them in a bastardized way. And nothing could be a better example than that of Murray Rothbard. You know, libertarians will mock her assertion that they steal from her all the time. Murray Rothbard, though, is a classic example. He got Aristotle and natural rights straight from Ayn Rand. If you read The Ethics of Liberty, sometimes you'll think he's channeling, you know, John Galt at times. He wasn't such a damn rationalist. Uh, but John Hospers, the first Libertarian Party candidate for president, he was converted from leftist politics by Ayn Rand in personal exchanges. Um, Reason Magazine, their leading uh, magazine. What is it? Reason is the title. Free minds and free markets cribbing straight from John Galt. A free mind and a free market are corollaries. So, no, they owe Ayn Rand. The entire libertarian movement owes Ayn Rand a giant debt. 
They largely steal their most powerful ideas from her or from Mises, <clears throat> right? Where they screw up, right? Is it with having a poor understanding of property rights and being anarchists like uh, Rothbard or cutting more significantly, cutting politics away from its deeper philosophical um, foundations. Um, that's really the so, main problem I have with these guys. And thank, and thank you, Mark, for the support. <laughs> So, James, where do you attribute then one of the most controversial positions of Rothbard, where he says, for example, well, if you take the ethics of liberty to their logical conclusion, it means you can take a kid outside in the in the piazza, in the square, in a, somewhere where many people will see you and say, hey, people, I'm, I'm leaving my kid here. And you or you can let it starve if so you have no positive obligation on towards your child no no i have to be very careful i don't want to be unjust i don't think he says you have a right to let it starve like in a, in a tyrannical way but he says also you haven't got a positive obligation towards the child therefore you should go and announce to the world uh, i'm leaving the child here am i am i getting this right that's basically it. You basically summarized it. You know, some of his argumentation like that, see, anarchism sort of corners him, doesn't it? You can't have the state intervening even with abused children. What a nightmare world he's actually creating. And he's got to think through all the ramifications of really having an anarchistic world. So we have competing government, we have competing governments in his view, right? We can't have intellectual property right? That's, you know, a violation of freedom as far as he's concerned. Um, pr uh, private property can be protected with deadly force. Someone, you know, crosses your un unfenced field, bang, you can shoot them dead. A lot of what Murray Rothbard's anarchism le leads to is the bizarre, fallacious logic and the weird examples that modern libertarianism is so rightly criticized for. So I can I remember, I remember Harry Binswink, I remember Harry Benzwanger emphasizing that there is no such thing as a market in force. Right. A market presupposes the absence of coercion. The, and, what, the system. <laughs> right. and what do you think is the source, though, of these mistakes? Is it rationalism that, that you start with freedom, so to speak, and then you see where does freedom take me? Right. And the consequences really don't matter. That is to say, we'll work around the consequences, right? As, as we, for example, uh, pr protecting children from their own parents, which is a vital role of government, it seems to me, he has to sort of explain away in a weird, funky way, doesn't he? Or intellectual. And again, just to, be, just to be very fair here, just to be very fair, many Rothbardians will say today that, look, Rothbard was wrong or misunderstood on that because, for example, if I take you for a ride with my private jet, I cannot then say, well, it's my property. I've had enough of you. Off you go and I throw you from the, from the airplane. So they say, well, you have invited, so to speak, in a way, the child. Of course, there they have weird disagreements when it comes to abortion, but you have invited the child. Therefore, you don't. So even some very hardcore Rothbardians, again, just to be very fair here, would dismiss this as a mistake of Rothbard. So not every anarcho-capitalist or even every Rothbardian would agree that you have a right, although it's not okay, to leave your child outside in the neighborhood and say, I can't take care of it. I would but even if, I, even if it starves, don't... don't exactly. uh, well, I would ask them a broader question. Isn't there a right to intervene when a child is being physically abused? See, they have to confront the idea that child abuse is itself a wrong of uh, initiation of force unconsented to because it's a minor and that the parent is on the moral hook for the safety of that child. To do that would be the equivalent of admitting that there's something like uh, intellectual property, you see, and those kind mm -hmm. of admissions really are problems for anarchists, aren't they? Yeah, and just to clarify something, because I, I think I didn't put in right way, and again, I don't want to stereotype. So Rothbard actually says, no, that the right solution is to go and give it to the neighborhood, but if you don't, you have an initiated force. So here's the rationalism. You have an initiated force towards the kid. You just, you're just poor. The, the kid starves. Now, it would be good if you take it out in the neighborhood. But if you don't take it out in the neighborhood, you have an initiated force. If the kids die, you're not responsible. Now, again, that's, that's a very 
very particular part of his thought. That's, I don't think this is what should characterize him, but I think it's important to see what is the method that could lead to such a thought. And for me, the way I understand it, with my poor understanding, that's rationalism. It is. It's a classic example of rationalism. It, it's not looking at the world from the concretes up, but from his theory down. And that really was the main problem with uh, Rothbard's methodology. Time and time again, I would get into arguments with him about just that kind of a thing. Uh, in reality, how would this look, Murray? I mean, what are we looking at here? So if I invent something, there's no intellectual property rights, or what do we do with the child who's just abandoned? They really haven't. The mother has not initiated force by abandoning the child in the public square. Okay. Or the property right owner, he can set up a deadly trap for anyone who wanders onto his property. All these things that libertarians rightly get grief for and that they're caricatured for, which Ayn Rand does not share uh, with Murat. Take, for example, uh, 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 disease quarantines. Ayn Rand actually was in favor of quarantining people who had deadly infectious diseases. The people with the disease, not the rest of us healthy people should be out in our house arrest. But if you were a disease, had an uh, infectious disease, the government could quarantine you because you're a threat of physical force to everyone else. A libertarian would have a hard time with that, you see. There's no theoretical way an anarchist libertarian, let me put it that way, could come And then to they, ju they yeah. jump around it with wishful things. So they say, well, you would expect that the airline, for example, who would bring you in uh, when we talk about closing borders to... So yes, anyway, uh, we've gone uh, beyond our usual time, but I think this is such a useful discussion. And again, one thing that I say every time, the way I see this discussion is not to is not to say, oh, that person is horrible. It's not an attack. It's mostly to understand. It's mostly to understand where does this vile attack come from? And also, even more important, why is Rothbard wrong? Because Rothbard could be right and we, everyone else who us could be wrong. So the reason I want to have these discussions or when we have the discussion about the Atlas Shrugged films or about uh, ob obje people who say they're objectivists, but they don't represent the philosophy in a right way, as we claimed, mostly it's to understand. It's not to point the finger. There's enough of it, so we wouldn't contribute something to it. Anyway, many, many thanks like, once more to James. Uh, your contribution to this discussion is something which is so important for us. We learned many things from you, so thank you. Jonathan, you've done also hard work. You did your homework as every time, so why don't you give the final parting words? No, definitely. Well, I'll quickly say, you know, uh, James, your comment about Rand's comment about quarantine is actually in my book, not in my book, but in Rand's book, Textbook of Americanism. So check that out. And also check out James' books, Passion of Ayn Rand's Critics and Creating Christ. Thank you all for your contributions, for watching and for subscribing to the Ayn Rand Center UK. We'll see, see you, you See you immediately in Clubhouse where the discussion continues, okay? We'll see you then. Bye, everyone. Have a Au good revoir. weekend.